you're going to find that many of the great leaders of the Jewish people started off as shepherds. Now, what a person ends up doing for a living has, some degree, has something to do with their choices, but it also has to do with the circumstances that surround them. Is that true? Why do you think, in terms of Hashem's vision for people, he would cause this that the people who he knew have the possibilities of really being great leaders? Why would he create life situations for them where they ended up as shepherds? A shepherd has to, if he's going to do his work with any level of integrity, he has to know how to care for others. So this is the position that Hashem puts people in. So the very first shepherd is you remember, or don't, right? This is Gesher. Could be yes, could be no. In the Garden of Eden story, after the expulsion, Adam and Chava had children, Cain and Hevel. They chose what they would do with the world, which was definitive of what they see the world is for. Cain grew things, and Hevel became a shepherd. Hevel said that to work with the world and to use the world as a bridge to God, you have to be a nurturer, not just a recipient. Okay, so it worked out that Moshe was a shepherd. Okay, so here's the storyline. This is what took him to what was the second greatest moment in his life. In his flock, a small sheep wandered off. He followed it. It distanced. He followed it more, further and further and further, until he saw the burning bush. So this recalls a similar incident with a completely different frame. Do you know how Avram discovered the Maratha Machpela? Okay, so he had the three mysterious guests who turned out to be angels in the disguise of humans. He decided to fell three oxen in order to be able to serve each of them a tongue, which in those days was viewed as a delicacy. So he went to the corral, opened the gate, one of the oxen ran away. He followed it until it led him to the cave of Machpela. So what you have is that sometimes if you start serving Hashem, Hashem will lead you to what will maximize your powers. Okay, so you have to keep your eye on this. See where Hashem is leading you and ask yourself what power could be maximized thereby. So what Avram learned when he saw the enormous spiritual splendor of the Marat Pela, which we don't see because we see the outside because we're tuned to the outside, was that what brought him there was his hospitality towards guests. What did Moshe see when he came across the burning bush? Okay, so if you were to see a bush burning and not being consumed by fire, what would your response be? Let's be honest with each other. Then we'll be get ready to go. Look for water. There's going to be like a forest fire. I don't know. This tree is, seems to be doing okay, but what about all of the... Okay, I could picture that. Or, wow, that's so funny. <laughs> Okay, uh, that would be my response. You know, like when I go home, I'm going to tell people about that. That's the weirdest thing I ever saw. Far out. Okay, clear? But Moshe, because he lived with higher consciousness, asked, where is Hashem leading me? So he stayed there to look. He didn't know what it was. Okay, clear? What was the first thing Hashem told him to do? He said, take off your shoes. Okay? So that requires some questioning. What difference does it make if he's wearing shoes or not? Okay, and again, here, oh, the weird bush, take off my shoes, what, whatever. Okay, why do we wear shoes? Let's be simple, why do we wear shoes? To protect us against the elements, right? So that means that wearing shoes is a tacit acknowledgement that the world is harsh. Is that true or not? Okay, so, Hashem told Moshe, take off your shoes. What you're going to see is something that's going to take you above the harshness of the world. So the words, take off your shoes, fit what he was seeing, which is the bush, the bush burning and not being consumed. The world seems harsh. The, room, the world seems headed towards its own destruction. But there's life force in there. There's something that you don't see. Take off your shoes to see it. There's a religious practice that requires somebody taking off their shoes. Do you know what it is? Okay, there are two of them. One is not practiced any longer, and one is. The one that's not practiced any longer is when a person went to the Beis HaMikdash. They were required to put aside their shoes, and also if they were carrying money in a, in a wallet or a bag, they had to push, put aside their money. Okay, clear? We're Jews. Could you imagine when people leave, were leaving what this must have looked like? I said size nine medium. <laughs> okay. So, but uh, leave, let's leave that alone. But um, we're told, take off your ways of protecting yourself against the world. This is a place where you'll see the world is basically a place of compassion. 
This is a place where you don't need self-protection. Not financial independence and not physical protection. Okay, the other practice, which is still done today, is as follows. Suppose a couple marry, and they have no children, and the man dies, okay? Now the man, let's say in our example, has brothers. The brother is obligated to marry the widow. Okay, this is called yibum. Okay, so get the first part of it again. The widow marries the dead man's brother. Okay, what? A Levite marriage. Okay, so this is still done today, sort of. Let's say they don't want to get married to each other. Okay, let's say he's married to someone else. So the way out of this obligation on his side, he's the one who's obligated. The way, um, the way he gets out of this obligation is going through a process called chalitza. Do any of you know Hebrew? What is lachlotz, do you know? Okay, so it means two things, and this will, this will untie this knot for you. Lachlotz means both to untie your shoes and to rescue someone. It's the same word. So if you ask, if you hear somebody saying, Efo kochota chalitza, where are the rescue people? They're not saying, who can help me take my shoes off? Okay, clear? Okay, so what they, so in this ceremony, okay, which has to be done in front of 10 people, okay, the man who doesn't want to marry the woman sits, you know, sits across from her and the, the judge asks, do you want to marry this woman? And he says, no, I don't. And he points out whatever financial benefits he would get through marrying her, whatever he would, you know, through joining her. And he says, I don't want. Then he sits down and she takes off his shoe, which is meant to be a sign of his disgrace, which is very different than the other two things that we said about taking off shoes. She takes, she takes off his shoes, spits towards him, not on him, towards him, okay? And the judges say, this is what shall be done to the man who will not build up his brother's home. Okay, clear? So this is a very difficult ceremony to understand. So the purpose of, I still have you? Okay. So the purpose of it is as follows. In general, we don't know. We don't know the ultimate fate of people after they die. We don't even know our own fate because we don't have an objective view of what our lives are. But certainly we don't know somebody else's fate. The way it works is that everybody is different because everybody here has a different mission. This makes sense so far? Let's say you do 80% of your mission and the world needs 100% of your mission. What happens then? Then you're sent back to finish the missing 20%. Okay, this is clear? So this is, if you understand this deeply, which it's a major, this is a major topic in Zohar, you'll understand why sometimes people's lives are so uninterpretable to others. Why would someone live 20 years? Why would somebody live five years? So the answer is they have something small to rectify. They don't need 80 years to do this. Okay, clear? So in the light of this, you'll understand something that was very interesting. One of the great rabbis of, of two generations ago was called the Chazon Ish after his famous work, He's the vision of man. Okay, when he was old and moving around was difficult for him, people would bring him, oftentimes they'd come for blessings or for advice, people would come with special needs children. And he would make a practice of walking them all the way to the door. So one of his students said, Rabbi, this child doesn't know that you're even showing him respect by walking him to the door. He doesn't understand this. Why are you bothering? So he said, God gave me so much talent and ability. Who knows what he expects of me? But this child has so little left to accomplish that he didn't need many tools. He's much further along the process than I am. Okay, you understand this? Okay. So in general, we're not meant to know where we're at in terms of the process of our progression, and certainly not where other people are at. Why do you think in general this is a closed door? You don't know what you're meant to accomplish in life. Let's say you did 80% of what you should do in, the, in, in previous lifetimes. And now your main task would be, let's say, to be extremely honest in money dealings. But you don't know that. For all you know, your main purpose in being here is to be compassionate. So why do you think God doesn't create us with awareness of previous lives so we would know where to put our energies? Because then your, then your, your efforts to like, give everything overall is like, special. 
Right, you're stifling yourself. So in general, we don't know. The one exception to this rule is where you have the case at hand, where a man dies without children, but he's married. That's telling us, the Torah reveals this to us, we would never know that this on this on, that this man's soul is not finished. This was not his last journey. We don't know what he has to fix, but we know he's not finished. So the purpose of the wife marrying an, the brother is to bring down the man's soul. Now oftentimes, and today this is required, oftentimes the man will say no. Because most people are not going to marry a woman for the sake of somebody else, even their brother. You can see where this is so. They'll marry her because they love her, or because they like her, or because she has a lot of holdings and whatever. Okay, clear? <laughs> okay, but they're not going to ma marry her totally to benefit another person and not themselves. You can see this? Okay, so when a person refuses to do this, their motivation is self-protection. You could see this? I want to protect my life. I don't want my life messed up. So therefore, the ritual involves taking off the shoes, saying, you, you are vulnerable. You may want to be invulnerable, but you know what? Nobody's invulnerable. OK, clear? So now we're going back to Moshe. Can I ask something? Madeline came. Yep. What? Because I, I heard recently that I didn't know that yeah. to pray, you have to be wearing shoes. Yes. So, so what's this about? Why don't we take off our shoes to pray like the Muslims do? <laughs> Why don't we do this only in the Beis HaMikdash? So the reason why is in a general sense, and this is going to be very connected to what we're going to say now, we're not supposed to see ourselves as totally vulnerable. We're supposed to take charge of our lives. We have to say, God gave me tools. I have to do something. I'm not going to take my shoes off. I'm going to be in the world. But in this situation, God said, take off your shoes, be totally vulnerable. Okay, and what did he say next? He said, in other words, I'm making this shorter. It's a long parsha, so I'm going to, that's why I'm not taking you to the text. I feel I should explain myself. Okay, um, I want you to take the Jews out of Egypt. If you were Moshe, what would you say? Um. <coughs> Who? Me? How? Okay, you could see that? And remember, Moshe didn't speak well, as we learned last time. Okay. So the reason Hashem told Moshe, chose Moshe was because of the kind of questions he would ask. Me? He was humble. The only kind of person who could redeem somebody else is a person who's totally humble. Why? What does humility have to do with redemption? Hmm? Humility have to do with redemption. True redemption means taking people back to where they could be themselves, to be themselves, not to be you, to be them. You understand this? So therefore, a leader's main quality should be his humility, his willing to let his people as individuals and as a group be themselves and not follow him to the point of mirroring his self-image. You understand this? Could you see where historically that hasn't always worked out? OK, clear? OK, so this is Moshe's side. But he had another issue. He said to Hashem, they're not going to believe me. They're not going to believe me. So if, um, if some religious leader would have come to the Jews in 1938, would they have believed that he's going to save them from the Nazis? No. Okay, so what Hashem answered is that the Jews have more capacity than you know. So we, Moshe did know of the, the capacity Jews have to some degree, and it worked to some degree. What's the story? So before the whole story that we learned last time about Moshe killing the Egyptian, you still remember <laughs> this? Okay. okay, when he was still a great favorite in Pyro's palace, but was still sympathetic to the Jews, one day he went to Pyro and said, you know, you can get much more work out of these people. Did Pyro want to hear this? What do you think? Yes. Of course. Those are the sweetest words, OK? So he says, how? So he said, give them off one day a week where they don't work at all. They'll renew their strength and they'll work a million times better than you do if you have them work seven days a week. So Pyro thought about this, and it made sense to him. So he said, OK, which day do you think? <laughs> OK. <laughs> So which day did Moshe choose, of course? 
Shabbos. Okay, so this is why in the Shabbos morning prayers, the first prayer you say after the three usual blessings that we begin with is Yismach Moshe, Moshe shall rejoice, by giving us the gift. Okay, so what he did was he made the Jews in the midst of their misery aware that they're living in a created world. Why is that important for people who are enslaved and miserable? Why is that important to know that their creation's living in a created world? Gives them hope. So this thread of knowing that there's hope is what made the Jews redeemable. Okay, so this is why Shabbos is so extremely important. It's the source of seeing yourself as a creation in a created world. Okay, what else gave, gave them hope? What else made them redeemable? So the, the Talmud says that there are three things they didn't change. Do you know what they are? They didn't change their clothing. They wore the same kind of clothing that they wore generations earlier. They didn't change their names. So the example in Midrash is Rudolf, <coughs> excuse me, Ruvain didn't become Rufus, okay? And they didn't change their language. They spoke Hebrew. But they weren't living good lives necessarily. We're told they, felt they sunk all the way down. So if they sunk all the way down, what difference does it make? What clothing they wear, what language they speak, what names they use? You keep identity. Exactly, they had identity. Exactly that. So having an identity means that even if you aren't living up to it, you know who you wish you could be. You know where you want to be. So these two factors made them redeemable. So God said, they're redeemable. <laughs> okay, you're, you're wrong. Okay, they will believe you. And I'm going to take them out of Egypt, out of all of their suffering. I'm going to bring them to Eretz Israel. So another thing that you have to acknowledge is that going to Eretz Israel is the end of the journey. It's not just leaving Egypt. How many of you saw this awful movie, The Ten Commandments? Did you see this? You did. You, the rest, did they miss anything? By not seeing it, what would you say, Nikita? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the old one is worse than the new one, I think. No, the new you one think is I didn't see the new child. one. <laughs> You're right, that's child. that's worse. Yeah, that's worse. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, the old one the old one, God didn't appear, you just hear this voice. And Moses was Charlton Heston, okay, who had a love relationship with Paro's daughter, who was Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> Okay, so I thought that that was pretty bad, but whatever. So, <laughs> Bert Law is Joshua, but the, so the reason I'm telling, I'm bringing you back to this hor horrific movie, is that the end of the story in the movie is Moses says to Pharaoh, "Let my people go," okay, and he does, and that's the end. <laughs> so I want to tell you something. This is something that's true in everyone's life as well. Going from is never the end. Going to is the end. You understand this? Going from is never, ever the end. Going to is the end. So from that perspective, there were four expressions that were used for the redemption. In Hebrew, they're hotzeti, hitzalti, gaalti, lakachti. I took them out. That could only be from. I rescued them, that can only be from. But I redeemed them, that's two. And I took them to me, that's two. So the from has to lead to the two, otherwise it's all <laughs> illusion. So Hashem said that the end of the story is that they'll arrive at some point in Eretz Israel. What difference does it make where you live? Suppose he would have said, and one day they'll get to Los Angeles. <sighs> okay. What difference does it make? So what's the difference between Eretz Israel and other places? Do you know? Okay, so I'll tell you why your reasoning is circular. I'm asking you why it's special. And you're saying it's special because God told Avram it's special. Okay. So, what do you think is special about Eretz Israel? It wasn't just after the Okay. 
So you're saying it's special because it's got to be special. <laughs> okay. The specialness there, and I want to quote you from the Torah later, in Chumash Devarim. It says, It's the land where Hashem's <laughs> eyes are cast from the beginning of time to the end of time. Eyes are cast from the beginning of time to the end of time. What does that mean? So I want to introduce you to the idea of anthropomorphisms in the Torah. An anthropomorphism is a word that you use that's, that denotes something physical to describe something that's not physical. So the Torah is replete with anthropomorphisms, huh? God's arm, his hand, his eye. So what are you supposed to, why did you think they used anthropomorphisms? What's the reason for this? Because we could relate to it, because we have problems. We think in physical reality. I took you through the banana exercise. Okay. In your mind's eye, see three bananas. You could do that easily? No problem. Move it up to seven. See if you could see seven bananas without counting them, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or breaking them into two groups, like four and three. How many of you could see seven in a row? And know it's seven without breaking them up or counting them. <laughs> it's very hard. Yeah. Some people can. Nobody could do this with 10. OK, clear? So the reason I'm giving you this exercise, which is actually Rambam's exercise, is we use words like infinite light, transcendental reality. And we, can't, can't, we don't even see seven bananas. <laughs> we, <laughs> OK. So we have a problem. So because of this, the Torah uses anthropomorphisms all the time. So the way you figure out an anthropomorphism is by asking, what does that part of the body do, and what does that say about God? So what do the eyes do? They see. They see. They bring the outside world into you, right? OK. Some of you may know this. Some of you may not. Why do we have two eyes? What does having two eyes do for you that one eye? Depth perception. Very good. OK, so not only do we see, but we see depth. So when you're talking about God sees, you're talking about God's awareness of everything that's on the outside and the depth of his awareness. OK, clear? So when you're talking about Eretz Yisrael, you're talking about the place where Hashem lets us experience the fact that he sees us, knows us, and is involved with us. So his presence is more revealed here. His presence is all over. But it's more revealed here than it is in other places. So this is what we mean when we talk about Eretz Yisrael being a place of great spiritual intensity. It's because we feel we have a perception of Hashem's presence here to the point that we get used to miracles and aren't even excited about them. Could you see where this is so? OK, so, um, so the most recent I could think of, like this is the miracle of the week, yeah? So if you go back a week and a half, you remember the um, terrorist attack in Armona Natsiv, right? How was the terrorist killed? Who shot him? <coughs> Who shot him? The soldiers. No. The Who guard. shot him? Guard. Which guard? Why was there a guard there? He was with a trip, not even their trip. OK, he was a regular. You've been to trips with the Nevei, and they have these soldiers with you on the bus. Just think about the people who you've seen on the bus with you. Would you think of them as being capable of killing a terrorist? You know, Yoram, who's like sitting there. OK, got this. He was leading a tour. He's just like a tour guide. OK, so that's a miracle that the one efficient, <laughs> okay, I shouldn't call that, that he's, okay, but the things like this happen all the time here? Yeah. Every, like, continually. Okay, so if you want to, you could see Hashem's presence externally through the miracles that are continued, but I want to tell you something much deeper. It's much easier to, for people to move themselves spiritually here. They internally feel Hashem's presence more. Could you see where that's true? Yeah. So I want to give you a proof of this, which I find fascinating. There are yeshivas here to help people who are just at the beginning move forward. Is that true? And they're successful. Is that true? OK. Nuvei, Sharim, or Sameach, Eish, others, yeah? 
is there any yeshiva anywhere else in the world, in America, in England, in South Africa, that does the job? Not really. They've start, they have lots of programs. But a full day yeshiva? No. Now, all of the resources are there. Okay, clear? The money is there, the people are there. But the, the inner yearning for God that we don't even know consciously is here. So people change more readily here. Could you see where this is so? And maybe it's just more conducive to being Jewish there. It is. But That's what I'm saying. Mean, why? Because you see it that way. Well, the reason why Jews are drawn here also has to be asked. Other people forget their original country of origin. Right, yeah. Okay, clear? Yeah. Okay, which is something, by the way, that no, like other people and often Jews themselves don't understand why Israel is Bukhal, you know, still on the map. They don't get it. Okay, clear? Okay, so moving beyond that. So Hashem is telling Moshe, I'm going to take these people who were so far and bring them all the way to where they experience Eretz Yisrael, but there's a middle stop. What do you think the middle stop is? The middle stop, and God tells them this in words, it's in the text, they're going to come to me on this mountain, meaning they're going to receive the Torah at Sinai. Without this middle stop, they can't move from being who they were in Egypt to they'll be at Eretz Israel. The middle stop is they're going to come to this mountain where you see this burning bush. They're going to come and receive Torah from me. Okay, so Moshe didn't want to go. He didn't want this job. He, it, it felt too big for him. Could you imagine being Moshe in this regard? He argued with God for a full week. Isn't that amazing? Like, <laughs> he's like, okay, so in the end he went, obviously. Okay, but his arguing showed a certain lack of awareness of the potential greatness of the Jewish people, okay, which is viewed as a, serious, as a serious flaw. So he said, who shall I say sent me? They're going to ask, who told you this? Now he know who, he could have like, he could have just, God spoke to me. But they wanted, he wanted to know a name <coughs> of God that the Jews will respond to. And God listened to him. It says, and God said, tell them this name. What name did he say? Do you know? Eh, yeah, asher, yeah, I am that I am, is how it's translated in English. But, how, again, somebody in this room knows Hebrew, right? Okay, you know Hebrew? You said a little bit? Okay. So, eh, yeah, what does that mean? I will, be. I will be, not I am. When it's translated, I am that I am, this is not an accurate translation. You put an aleph in front of a verb in Hebrew, it brings it into future tense. So what does it mean, I will be what I'll be? And he repeats it three times. Tell them, you know. It means, whatever I want to be, that's what I will be, meaning, I will take you out if that's what I want to be. I'll make you able to bear the burden of Torah if that's, if that's what I want. The same way I will be with you in the future, that's how I was with you in the past. I, and I'll let you be my people, meaning you have hidden potentials. Every Jew, since we're in Hashem's image, could say, I will be who I could be. I have the, the possibility of potential. Okay, so Moshe goes back to Egypt, as he should, Okay, now remember, all of these years, he had left Egypt when he was young, after he had killed the Egyptian. Now he's 80, okay? <coughs> Many years have passed. Who is leading the Jews all these years? His brother, Aaron. Be Aaron for a minute. You've been leading the Jews for decades and decades. Okay, you think of this as sort of your permanent role in life. Yeah, is that sensible? Totally sensible. And then he's back. How would you feel about that? Annoyed. Annoyed, jealous. Maybe relieved. What? Maybe relieved. If, I, if you didn't like the job, you'd feel relieved. But if you did like the job, <laughs> you'd feel like Maybe Hillary not. felt the day after the election. <laughs> okay, clear? So it says in the Torah, when Aaron saw Moshe coming, now remember there was no communications in those days. He didn't know he was coming until he was there. He rejoiced in his heart. 
Who's saying that he rejoiced in his heart? Not Aaron about himself. God about Aaron is saying Aaron rejoiced in his heart. That's an enormous statement about Aaron, is it not? Okay, so what was there to be so happy about? He was glad to see Moshe back. He was glad if, if this is what God wants, of course this is what I want. There's no separate thing. There's not my will and God's will. If this is what God's want, this is wonderful. This is perfect. This is as it should be. So Moshe's mission now is to go to Paro's castle and tell him that, uh, yes, okay, to let, to let the Jews go. You know the right lines. <laughs> Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so he was told to gather the elders and to take them with him on this mission. And they came, they were respondent. When he told them he came in the name of God, there were also certain signs that he had. Okay. He was able to he was able to do like little miracles, like turning turning sticks into snakes and backwards. He could you know, he could do the weird stuff that uh, that gave him some level of credibility. But as they were heading towards the palace, each of the, uh, the elders, they started slipping away. Okay, they were afraid to, they were afraid to face Paro. So they all had excuses. Oh, right, Wednesday. Oh, no, that's dentist. Okay, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know, or, I left the fire on the stove. I have like okay, whatever excuses they made. We don't know what excuses they made. But in the end, he went with Aaron, and that was all. Okay. Now he knew he didn't speak well, so Hashem said Aaron will be his spokesperson. So a lot of the things go through with with Moshe and repeated in a more eloquent way by Aaron. Okay. Paro thought that firstly he was extremely surprised to see Moshe, as you can imagine. But um, he thought this was ridiculous. So he said, as a very two-word two line, a very famous line, Moshe says, God sent me. You know what he said? Who's God? What are you talking about? Okay, who is God? So be Paro for a moment. So I want to tell you something about Paro's history. And it'll tell you... Uh, in order that you understand what misinterpreting reality is all about. Years later, when Yaakov was still alive, Paro or his predecessor, we don't know which one, okay, asked Yaakov to bless him. Do you remember that part at the end of this, of the Yosef story? So Yaakov blessed Paro. What was the blessing? That when he go near the Nile, that the waters rise towards him, okay? So if you were Paro, you asked Yaakov for a blessing. It came true. It came true visibly and tangibly. What conclusion would you reach? God's real. What conclusion did he reach? Far out. Look at that. <laughs> Got this? He, so he eventually developed a theology. I don't know if you're aware of this. Do you know how, what the Egyptian um, belief system was? Their holy book was called the Book of the Dead. They believed that there was a spiritual hierarchy. It's, it's not that distant from Indian thought. And if a person is very empowered or whatever, if they're very high on the pyramid, that they're superior. And then in the future life, they'll be in a higher place and that people have to be subservient to them. That was basically their theology. And that this person who's the head has mastery over different natural forces. So in the Egyptian pyramids, you'll have pictures of cats, sheep, various other things that represent different natural forces. So Paro's conclusion is, I am the Nile. I've created it. It's in response to me. So I have to tell you something I just read yesterday. This is phenomenal in terms of like denial of reality. So, so um, one of the stories in Prophets is that when Joshua was conquering the land, he was in a battle with people who were enemies in a place called give on, and he made the sun stand still to be able to, to finish the battle. Okay, that's the story in the prophets, okay? So a team of astrophysicists and various other scientists came to the conclusion that indeed, that there was an, a, so, a, a lunar eclipse, so the sun seemed to shine longer that day. What does that prove to them? 
The very day, it says in the prophets, the sun stands still, it stood still. What does that prove? No, 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 no. Far out. Look at that coincidence. <laughs> okay, got this? People are capable of such extreme denial of what they see. Like, did you ever, did you ever see this? I always picture CNN, it's the splitting of the sea. Did you ever picture this? Like, Look, Bill, it looks like the, the, the east wind's really working with Moshe today. <laughs> it's like, you know, this is his lucky day. Why, look at those winds. How many knots an hour did you say we got? I got this. They would like only look at the event and never look at the source. In a million years, they would never look for the source. Okay, clear? So that's where power was at. So he says, who's God? Okay, so at that point, Moshe showed him the, the miracles that God taught him to do. Okay, the Egyptian sorcerers were able to do their stuff as well. There's disbelief, okay? But Paro drew a conclusion, okay? The conclusion was, the Jews have too much leisure. That's why they're creating this redemption fantasy. We have to make them work harder. So the work that they did primarily was building the store cities, which required them working with bricks. The way they made bricks in earlier times was by using um, straw and mud, okay? Let's stop providing them with straw, let them gather their own straw, they'll have to work harder, and then they won't have time for this nonsense. So, yeah, because yeah. yeah. that he thought it was beneficial to his purpose. Okay, so now he's having them work harder. Be Moshe, what would you say to God? The Jews are more miserable than before. Everything is worse than it was before he came. Okay, so I want to tell you that when people are honest with themselves, they'll know that there are two, there are two kinds of questions. There are questions that aren't questions at all. There are statements that are in the disguise of questions. Why are you being so bad for that people? That's a statement. That's not a question. But when you expect an answer, you want to know what's the reason for this? What's your hidden plan? It's a whole other thing. Moshe was asking a question question, not a statement question. So we got an answer. The answer is, it's from the midst of this suffering I'm going to show the miracles such as those that have never occurred in the world, which is what happened. So what he's saying is for people to have an appreciation that it was God who was doing these miracles and not some external force, they had to realize how totally disempowered they are. So that's what the Parsha ends with. And what we're going to talk about next time is taking all of the events we spoke about today. We have a class tomorrow, right? Okay, we're going to talk about the same storyline, but take it much deeper. So bring Chumash, I want to show you some things inside, okay?